Hi, this is Sean D'Souza from Psychotactics.com, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about working less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy your work and enjoy your vacation time. This is the Three Month Vacation. I'm Sean D'Souza. What you're about to listen to is the last rerun of this season. We ran four episodes from 2015, the most popular episodes, and this one is my personal favorite because it's about storytelling. Now, when you listen to it, you'll realize that you recognize some of the stories, especially if you've listened to this before, and that alone gives you an inkling into the power of storytelling. You can hear or read some information some other place and then you forget the details or there's too much information. But with stories, you just have to hear it once and you remember most of the information. And here's the test we're going to find out in this episode itself. You're also going to notice some of the technical aspects like the music and all the other little things that you probably missed in the first round. But for now, enjoy this round of storytelling. This is the three month vacation, and I'm Sean D'Souza. I was about two years old when I first had a bout of convulsions. Well, it didn't start off as convulsions. I was standing there on the balcony looking out on the road, and then I kind of fell off the stool that I was standing on. And as the story goes, I ran to my mother and she noticed that I was having convulsions and she panicked. Now, panicked would be the wrong word to use because what she did next was bundle me in her arms and run with me to the hospital. To put you in the frame of mind of what India was when I was growing up, There were no phones, or most people didn't have phones, and they didn't have cars, and you probably had a scooter if you were well off. And that's just how things were back then. And what she had to do was run a distance of two kilometers, maybe three kilometers, to get to the nearest hospital. When she got to the hospital, they wouldn't admit me because I had meningitis and the hospital was not in a position to deal with cases of meningitis. And somehow she managed to get them to admit me. But at that point in time, they asked for the mother. Now, my mother was very young at that point in time and they assumed that she was somehow the sister and they said, no, 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 you have to get the mother. This is very odd in India because people tend to get married very early in India and yet they were insisting that they had to have the mother before they could go ahead with anything. And there I was not doing so well and the hospital authorities wouldn't go ahead without dealing with the mother. Now, she convinced them, but once they admitted me, there was one more problem. The doctor wasn't so sure that I would survive the meningitis. He told my parents, and by that point, my father was there as well. And he said, I have to tell you this. Your son will either die or he'll go mad. What you just heard was a story of my youth. The question is, why did you keep listening? Why did the story work? What is it that caused you to pay attention and not move away from the story? Stories are useful for presentations. They're useful for books. They're useful for webinars. They're useful for pretty much everything. And what happens is most of us load up our information with facts and figures, and those are very tiring, but stories, they encapsulate everything. And we're gonna learn how to create stories that are very powerful. The three things we're gonna cover today are, one, the wall. 
second, the reconnect, and third, the anticipation. Let's start off with the first one, which is the wall. Every afternoon, every weekday, I go through the same routine. I pick up my niece from school, and she's now 11, so that's Marsha. And we speak about stuff in the car. We do multiplication tables, but recently we've been doing storytelling. I usually when I ask her, tell me a story about what happened on the weekend, she goes, well, nothing. Then I say, what happened in class? And she goes, nothing. And this is the interesting part. You think that there's nothing happening in your life, but there is a lot happening all the time. So then we have to zero in onto one little thing and make it interesting. Just about anything becomes interesting in the way you tell it. And so I said, tell me about your piano class on Saturday. And her little face brightens up and a smile comes on and she goes, well, I didn't practice before going to piano class on Saturday. And then when I got to the piano class, I was really afraid because I thought I would play the piece really badly. But as it appears, I played it quite well. In fact, I played it so well that the piano teacher said, I'm going to put you on a more advanced piece. And of course, once she gave me the advanced piece, I couldn't play it. So she said, no, 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 you're playing it in the wrong key. So Masha tried to play it in the right key, but it didn't work. The piano teacher gave her another chance, and of course she was not playing the piece well, so they went back to the old piece, which is what she had practiced. And so Masha was quite happily playing her old piece, but playing it by ear, not reading the notes. Happy as a lark, when she looked at the corner of the room and there was her mother. And according to Marsha, her mother was glaring at her because Marsha hadn't improved and she was back to square one. How could the day have been worse for Marsha? Now that was a really short story, but why were you hooked into the story? The reason the story works is because there were these little blips along the way what we call the wall. So what is the wall? The wall is, think of it as like a heart monitor. So the heart monitor, when it's absolutely flat, will go beep, there is no sound. And then when the heart is beating, it will go And there is this little spike that jumps in every now and then, and that creates a wall. That creates that factor that you know that your heart is actually working. And this is what happens in storytelling. Most people tell a story in a very boring fashion. And the reason why they tell that is because their story would just go from one end to the other without the spikes. So what were the spikes in Marsha's story? Well. The first spike was the fact that she was afraid. She hadn't practiced, and so that got your attention. Then she went on to a new problem, which is that she had to go there to the class and then play a new piece. And then when she couldn't play that new piece, she ran into a whole bunch of problems. She was thrown back to the old piece, which was a good thing at least in Marsha's eyes, but bad thing in the mother's eyes, which is why the mother was glaring at her from the corner of the room. And then, as Marsha finished the story, she says, how could the day get worse? And this is a perfect little story just told from one end to the other with all of these little blips. These little blips, they're the wall. They're the wall that you have to climb across. So you get into the alley and there is a wall there and you have to climb over that wall to get to the other side. And this is what creates interest. The wall can be an obstacle. It can be something funny. It can be something unusual. 
as long as it changes the pace of the story, it becomes a wall because you now have to get over that wall onto the other side before the story can continue. And most stories don't run that way. So for instance, if we look at Masha's story, we could say, well, we went to piano class and on the way, I almost slipped in a banana peel, but then I recovered because I wasn't feeling so well. Anyway, I got to the class and I played my piece and uh, then I played the second piece and you can see where the story is going, but at one point in time, when she slipped in the banana peel, you got that spike in your head. Even though you might not have thought about it at the time, there was that spike. And you see the spike everywhere. What's more important is the spike has been with you right since you heard your first story being read to you as a kid. So if you look at something like Red Riding Hood, well, it's a very simple story. The girl goes to her grandmother's house and she's got this bag of goodies that her mother has packed for the grandmother. But what happens along the way? Well, Red Riding Hood runs into the wolf. Before that, there was no problem at all. The forest was not that intimidating. She got flowers along the way, but then Along came the wolf, and the wolf creates the spike in the story. Now this is a wall that she has to get over. She has to solve that problem. If you look at all the stories that you heard or have told your kids, you will find a consistency in this wall, this obstacle, which means that we have to create stories with these spikes, with these obstacles, and then we have to climb over these obstacles, or rather take the reader or the listener across the obstacle and then to the other side. So here's what I do with Marsha. I make her sit down with a sheet of paper and then I get her to draw a line across. And at the starting point, she has, say maybe she's going to piano class. In the ending point, it is whatever happens at the end. But in between, I get her to draw little dots or little spikes, whatever you want to call them, and she has to put in those obstacles. And as soon as she puts in those obstacles, we fill in the rest later. The point is, once you identify those obstacles, you are able to turn out far better stories. Because now what you've done is you've created a bounce, you've created an obstacle, you've created a wall, and of course, people have to then go over it. When I started out this podcast, I started out with a story about meningitis. And I didn't spend time explaining to you how I was looking out of the window. I went straight into the bounce, straight into the wall. I had convulsions. I fell down. I then had to run to my mother. And you have been thrown right in the middle of this bounce. And of course, the bounce didn't stop until we kind of got to the hospital because now you're thinking, okay, things are gonna get okay. And then we have another wall. They won't admit me to the hospital. Then we get over that wall and now they're asking for the mother because they don't believe that my mother was the mother, that they thought that she was the sister. And then when all of those problems have been resolved, the doctor says the chances are not good. So what we have are these bounces all along the way, these walls all along the way, and you have to cross over, get over these walls to create a great story. And this is just the first element of storytelling. The second one is the concept called the reconnect. So what is the reconnect? Right at the end of the previous section, which is when I was talking about the wall, I went right back to the story on meningitis. And immediately your brain went from wherever it was right back to that original story. And this is what storytellers use very effectively. They use the reconnect. They connect back to something they told you a while ago. And it's very powerful because that creates a bounce of its own. It takes you from where you are to where you used to be. So if you ever watch the movie Star Wars, there is this concept called the Force. It's use the Force, Luke, use the Force. How many times does the word Force show up in Star Wars? 
apparently more than 16 times. So there you are in the cinema or watching the movie on a DVD or maybe on your computer. But you run into this concept of the Force and every time that reference to the Force shows up and you don't really notice it, but it just shows up. It takes you back to wherever you originally heard it or saw it. But why is this reconnection so cool? The first thing is that often it makes you feel very intelligent. So the story is set up in a way that you know what is coming. And when it does arrive, it makes you feel extremely intelligent. That's what storytelling is about. It's about making the reader feel a lot happier or a lot sadder than they used to feel. And so you can feel that happiness or sadness as I edge into the meningitis story. You know what is coming next. You know how that story ended. So it makes you feel very intelligent. It makes the reader, the listener feel very intelligent. But the second thing it does is it creates bounce. It bounces you back to wherever you were and that creates that spike. So it's doing a dual job, but it does one more thing. It closes a loop. So you can start off a story and then not end the story. Notice what happened with my story. I didn't close that loop. I told you that the doctor said I would die or go mad. The loop wasn't closed. And so what you can do is, if you're reconnecting at some point, you can close that loop. It's very trendy to keep the loop open, but it drives people crazy. Like this morning, I was on my walk and I was listening to an audiobook about the brain. And this author was talking about how he was at a David Attenborough conference. And he was sitting there with someone else and they were having a discussion. And then he went into the discussion and about 20 minutes later, I'm going, what did David Attenborough have to do with it? And he never closed that loop. And he will never close that loop. And it will leave that gap in my brain. And that's not a good thing. So you want to create that disconnect, but then you want to reconnect later. You want to close that loop. And that is the power of the reconnect. And with that, we go to the third part, where we talk about anticipation and why it's so critical in storytelling. We were doing our workshop in Campbell, California, around the year 2006. And one of the participants stood up and she was going to tell her story. She told us that her mother was very, very beautiful. She also told us that her sister was a lot like her mother. She then went on to tell us how her father would take photographs, but photographs of the mother and the sister. Notice how we haven't completed that story. We haven't really told you what comes next, but the anticipation is killing because you know what comes next. And this is the beauty of anticipation. You create anticipation knowing fully well that you're not leaving any gaps, but that the client, the listener, your reader is filling in the story, that 10%. And this is what Anil Dharkar told me when I was growing up and I was just starting out in my cartooning career. Anil was the editor of a newspaper called Midday. And I was drawing cartoons for that newspaper and one day he came up to me and he says, Sean, you're giving too much away. You need to get the customer, the reader, to anticipate that 10%. So you're giving away 90% of the story, but you are getting them to anticipate the 10%. Because readers and listeners and clients are very intelligent. And what you should do is leave out the bits. Don't give the entire story. Now, when you think about the advice you're getting here on this podcast, you think, wait a second, you just said not to leave out gaps. Yes, you don't leave out the gaps. You reconnect, but you don't tell the entire story up front either. So to take an example, you got the story about the meningitis. You got the story about how I got admitted to hospital, but 
what happened next you don't know the rest of that story that gap hasn't been closed and yet you're intelligent enough to figure out that there was an ending and how that ending shows up that we'll find out but the reason why we have anticipation is because it creates suspense it creates a knowing suspense so when you say the boy got on the bus he would never get off what you're doing is you're going into the brain of the customer and they can see something bad unfolding when i told you about that father that never took photographs of one of the daughters you could see that insecurity building up you could see that loneliness that detachment no one had to explain that to you but you can do this very simply by saying i woke up expecting it to be a great day and within those few words you have already created anticipation the reader knows the listener knows that it's not going to be a great day so how is it going to unfold these are the lines that you have to put in your speech in your presentation in your writing because when you put in these lines they create that pause they create that white space they create that breathing space and it allows the reader to anticipate what's going to happen next how is it going to twist and turn so in the marsha story where she talks about just how she went to piano class she could say i thought it was going to be a very bad day and immediately your mind goes racing forward to wait she said bad day but she didn't sound like it was going to be a bad day so did it turn out to be a bad day or not and when she got to the piano class and she was able to play now you're relaxing and then she puts in the other spike and she goes i played that piece really well and that created another problem for me notice what's happening the anticipation is setting you up for that spike the problem that comes next so first the anticipation then the problem the anticipation then the problem and really this is what you have to do when you're writing great stories you have to get the reader in the framework in that frame of mind so that they know that there is something going to change something i was about to open the drawer when or i walked down the garden expecting it to be a completely miserable day it had been raining all morning and you know even though you don't know how the story is going to unfold you know that there is going to be a change you're creating anticipation you're creating that space for the reader and the listener to fill in the gaps in their head and that makes them again feel very intelligent but it also sets it up for that spike that we talked about in the first section So what we've covered in today's podcast has been three things and the first thing has been the wall and the wall creates those spikes it creates that drama it creates all of those blips that cause you to pay attention to the story the second thing we looked at was the reconnect how we start of something at the beginning then somewhere in the middle we connect and then we connect at the end and there are these connections all over if you listen to episode number 54 you can hear all of these connects so go back to episode number 54 and you can see all these reconnects walls and anticipation and of course that takes us to anticipation which is that moment that tells you that something's going to change and it creates the suspense and it's very very powerful in storytelling it's this breathing space this quiet just before the storm So what's the one thing that you can do today? The one thing that you can do today is go back to episode number 54 and listen to that episode because I listened to it just a few days ago and it has all of this stuff. I mean most of the podcasts have it but I just listened to episode 54 so I know it's there so go back and listen to it 
and you will see that the wall, the reconnect, and the anticipation is there, and you'll get a much better idea because you'll be able to know in advance when that's showing up. I had mentioned that we were going to do some workshops in Nashville, Tennessee, and in Amsterdam, which is in the Netherlands. We're still looking for a venue. If you know some venues, let us know. But in the meantime, if you would like to sign up for a storytelling workshop, then just email me at sean at psychotactics.com. We will send you more details. It's still a work in progress. As you know, we still haven't found the venue, which is the first step. But if you know of something, let us know. Storytelling is incredibly important, and a lot of us leave out storytelling. We give facts and figures, and this is why most books and presentation and webinars are so boring. The reason why you find the brain audit so interesting is the number of stories and analogies and examples in it. And go back and read your copy of the brain audit, or go to psychotactics.com slash brain audit and buy a copy, and you will see how critical it is to have these stories and how it reminds you of what you learned weeks, months, years after you learned it. In the end, statistics don't sell. The story, the emotion that's built in within that story and a story well told is what sells a product or a service. So your goal for this year and the years to come must be to tell better stories, not to give more information. And that brings us to the end of this episode. If you're in 5000 BC and you're a member, then please go in and ask questions about storytelling and I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. If you haven't joined 5000 BC, then get your copy of the Brain Audit first, read the stories, and then join 5000 BC. So you know how I started this episode with the doctor saying that I would die or go mad. Well, I didn't die. (laughs) That's me, Sean D'Souza, from the three-month vacation. Saying bye for now. Bye-bye.